What I'm going to talk about now is basically, um, who's familiar with the Lakovsky multi-wave oscillator? Okay, about 40% or so. Um, who has one? Whether you built it yourself, you got one from us, or you got one from someone else. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So about ten, about 10 or 11 people. So. Recently, I've been trying to put together a new website, uh, vril.io, V-R-I-L.io. That's where a lot of the physical products are going to go, like the BDNE RPX sideband generator, the Lakowski MWO, and I they have like a mini encyclopedia of products that are going to be going on here uh, as time permits. Is anybody familiar with the word Vril? Just a handful. So Lord uh, Buteweiler was a Rosicrucian back in the 1800s, and he wrote a book called Vril, the Coming Race, and it was a story where he went down into the inner earth and encountered these beings who had the mastery over this life force energy that he called the Vril, which could be used to heal, it could be used to kill, or, um, and they had such, such mastery, and there were uh, uh, discussions of automatons, which was the first description of robots. And it's basically the world's first science fiction book that was ever written. Uh, it's free download if you look for it online. And so uh, a lot of people over the years have used this term Vril to describe just a, a kind of a generic, you know, chi, ki, uh, you know, the ether, you know, this quantum flux potential, whatever you want to call it. And so, you know, plus it's pretty short and kind of easy to remember once you know what the word is. But on there, if you click mouse over products and you, uh, two things will pop up, one for the RPX and one for the Lukowski MWO. And I kind of put like a simple kind of basic walkthrough on there on what, on what this is about. But also if you go to emediapress.com and if you type in the search box Lukowski uh, uh, or just MWO, you'll pull up a handful of uh, posts that I put in there and refer, uh, some of them have links to uh, one of uh, Lukowski's books called The Secret of Life. And that's a free download, so you can see from Lakovsky in his own words what his perspective is. And if you search online, there's a handful of books you can get for free in English that you can just download to learn more about what Lakovsky was after. Um, there's also a book he wrote in French that was never put in English. I think I'm the only one in the world who has a copy in English uh, because I had it translated. Uh, at some point, I'll make that available to the public. Um, but the Lakovsky, uh, way back in early 1900s, and so... Uh, Paul Babcock gave a, one presentation, and it was on the u called Universal Medium. Paul Babcock's a local friend of ours, an engineer here in uh, Spokane, and he gave a presentation a couple years ago, Universal Medium, which was kind of his journey and his path of making an MWO based on uh, information that came out about maybe 10 years ago on what the MWO actually was. Um, Lakovsky was a researcher in Europe, and he was kind of going around uh, looking uh, why there are certain dis clusters of people who had diseases in different areas. And he found a couple of things relating to low soil conductivity or, you know, where one underground water stream may be going in one way and one crosses it. What, if anybody is living above that, they're going to get very, very sick. Uh, he was one of the first ones to kind of discover these kind of um, uh, connections between the earth and people's health. And he was also very familiar with the concept of the ionosphere having, you know, a couple hundred thousand volts between the upper ionosphere and the earth as neutral. And so if you divide that per meter, you're looking at maybe a couple hundred volts per meter is the voltage that we're all standing in like two capacitor plates. And if you're um, maybe in a thunderstorm, it could be as high as maybe like 10,000 volts per meter. Uh, last year I did a presentation called electrobiohacking 
which is about altering the genetic expression of plants without genetic modification by using high voltage at a very high voltage density per centimeter to get those seeds germinating and access genetics that are lying dormant within there. Um, so it's kind of like a Jurassic Park technology, but it's safe, it doesn't alter the genetics. But that goes into a lot uh, about the earth ionospheric connection as well. So everything, all of us, plants, people, animals, everything are evolving and growing inside of this voltage field. And if that voltage field isn't optimized, then health is gonna suffer, plants aren't gonna grow very well. Um, they know that in some of the areas towards the North Pole, when they look at, at some of the trees that are growing, uh, the growth rings are always the thickest and the strongest and the healthiest whenever they had high aurora uh, borealis um, uh, activity. So wherever there's more activity, the, the plant life thrives. And so one of the first things Lakovsky was doing, um, which you know Paul goes into it into un in his universal medium talk, and then he did another talk, I think it might have been last year, um, also dealing with these concepts, was that Lakovsky was experimenting with plants and there's different types of plant cancers and what he was doing was kind of looking at these connections and how he could um, kind of reverse these disorders in the plants, you know, naturally in, in a fairly non-invasive way. And so he would cut these metal rings, which would come around and kind of overlap a little bit, but they weren't shorted. If it's just shorted, then it's just kind of like a capacitor ring. But he left it open, and so what happens is in our environment, there's a lot of natural frequencies happening all over, all these cosmic rays and you know, different frequencies emitting from the sun, and it's just a whole soup. It's really a kind of a complex kind of deal, even if you have, you know, your master and all the RF stuff and everything. It's just kind of mind-boggling what, what is really going on and how they all interact with each other. Well, any of these rings are going to course, you know, so every frequency has a, there's a wavelength. There's a length that each wave has. Uh, you know, low frequency will have these really long waves. High frequencies will have little shorter waves. Uh, and so whatever wavelength or fraction of a wavelength would correspond to the length of those rings, that ring is going to oscillate and vibrate at that frequency that the plant is bathing in. And after a couple months, these uh, like tumors and stuff just fall, out, fall off and the plant just kind of normalizes. And so one thing I want to say is I'm not making any medical claims. This is just kind of a you know, research device. The Lakovsky MWO, they're, they're just available as a device to study what Lakovsky actually really did because there's a lot of misinformation about it um, and so Lakovsky took that idea with the rings and little by little kind of proceeded where he kind of developed these antenna rings I don't know if you can see them over here but they're the concentric rings um, which are not physically not electrically connected to each other so they're capacitively kind of coupled to each other and there's this whole idea that it's a multi-wave oscillator. And actually, that's not even really proven. It's just kind of Lakovsky's idea that all these rings are vibrating at their own frequencies and that kind of stuff. Um, and what feeds it is this device sitting on the, that round table deal there. That's called a pulse modulator, which has a high voltage power supply. It has chokes, which are these little coils that kind of prevent uh, high frequency kind of stuff from feeding backwards into the transformer and it has a spark gap in there uh, which is adjustable um, and so the high voltage jumps the spark gap and and there's all this cacophony of you know uh, sparking and, and all these radio frequencies and stuff are, are created and all this is emitted at a high voltage output which goes through the coils that steps it way up in voltage and this is available at these rings and so you know, the idea of this multi-wave oscillator kind of business is that each ring has its own resonant frequency and stuff, but the rings are really kind of coupled too tightly together for each, for any specific ring to actually vibrate on its own particular frequency. The antennas would have to be probably about maybe 12 feet in diameter with enough spacing, a couple, you know, several feet for each one to have its own distinct frequency. But no matter what the, uh, you know, what's really going on there, it's a device that a lot of people are finding some very interesting things. Some people are saying, well, you know, I didn't notice a whole lot, all the way to some pretty profound stuff, life-changing experiences, bathing in this life, feels, uh, life force energy kind of field, which is, which is really what it is. It's augmenting the, you can say, the ionospheric to uh, ground connection in a way, um, even kind of beyond what, what Tesla was doing. Tesla kind of had these, this kind of concept, but it was distinctly different from Lakovsky 
And that's one of the things that I just want to show real quick is what's the difference with how Tesla would do it and what's the way that Lakovsky would do it. Because with good engineering practices, you look at Lakovsky's method and it's like you'd never want to build it like that because it doesn't make any sense. You're grounding one of the phases. It, it's all lopsided. You know, what's the point? And so simply, um, so let's say this box here is the pulse modulator. The output of it are these pulse caps, which are alternating really fast in the AM frequency band. And Lakovsky was operating at about maybe 700 to, you know, 900 uh, thousand kilohertz. So if you're looking at, you know, what is 800 on the AM radio station, well, that's 800 thousand uh, cycles per second. Uh, you know, 900 a uh, AM is 900 thousand cycles per second. But there's all these extra frequencies and everything uh, created, but that's basically the frequency the whole thing is tuned to when you account for the capacitor sizes and, and all this kind of stuff. And so the output is essentially um, capacitors like this coming out, and then all the spark gap and all the high uh, voltage business and everything is happening down here. And as it feeds it out, the way Tesla would do it, and uh, how Eric Dollard had the original balance set up, is that um, it's very symmetrical, very balanced. You have this uh, primary coil here, which is center tapped down to the ground or the chassis. And then the output of this are, is basically going to be feeding these secondaries, which steps the voltage way up. And then you have these antenna rings. And so what this is, is a balanced system, which can be wired up like that with the exact same pulse modulator. It just requires two equal coils. And it's going to require a separate primary that's isolated from these. That's exactly halfway between both of the secondaries, center tapped and grounded. And what happens is, as the dielectric lines of force go like this, back and forth, at, you know, 7, 800, 900 cycles, 1,000 uh, cycles per second, and if somebody is standing in the middle, or whoever's in the middle of there, they're getting th bathed in that oscillating field. Um, what this actually is, is it's not really current moving. There's like a displacement current. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It's basically like an electrostatic um, field that's, that's static for a very, very short period of time, and then it reverses like this. What happens in here is the, the, you can say this is a longitudinal type waveform, which is not transverse. Um, and what I mean by that is if you have like a, uh, a radio station, AM radio station, and let's say this is the Earth, and you have a big antenna here, you know, broadcasting out, and you got your vehicle, you know, 20 miles down the road with your little AM antenna. From here, there's these transverse waves that kind of come here to the antenna, where the waveform is kind of moving like this, and it gets the amplitude gets a little bit weaker and weaker and weaker uh, over distance, where it's kind of like diminishes by the the what's called inverse square law. It diminishes by the square of the distance uh, as it moves away from the source. So if you and I had a rope and I whipped one end and you're at the other. Well, it's going to kind of go like this all the way down, but the amplitude gets lower and lower and lower because energy is being lost 90 degrees to the direction that it's traveling, right? So by the time it gets to its destination, it's going to be kind of weakened. And these waves are typical Hertzian, I guess you could say, electromagnetic waves, and they're, the speed that they're traveling is pretty much, you could say, up to uh, light speed. So it's pretty fast. Well, simultaneously, every single AM radio station is transmitting through the ground, through the Earth. And so if you make a Tesla-style crystal radio or a Tesla-style radio receiver and you pick it up in the ground, what happens is um, you don't get this kind of loss. Over the exact same distance, not only do you have virtually no loss from here to here, you have... Um, uh, it gets there faster. It gets there before these light speed waves. And so it's, what this is actually doing is polarizing the ether in between. And if you don't understand what the ether is or you don't believe in it or you're not really familiar with the concept, by the end of this conference, especially after James DeMeo does you know, both his presentations, you're, you're going to walk away at least thinking, well, 
okay? It's going to be very hard to argue with any of it. Um, and so what it is literally doing is it's polarizing the ether between two different points of uh, uh, reference. And as it's polarizing that, this is what the body is bathing in. This is kind of a closed loop right here. And so what it means is there's very little loss or noise or interference that's going to be broadcast because it's all contained right here. It doesn't really have anywhere to go because it's balanced. They feed each other perfectly like this. So what the difference is with Lakovsky's method is that draw it a little bit bigger. Let's say that these are the capacitors coming out like this. Uh, one side will have a primary, let's see, draw it a little bit better. So the primary is basically an input coil which usually has wi uh, larger wire and it has smaller turns and this is where the input is. Okay, and then it feeds a lot of windings that are a lot smaller and that kind of steps the voltage up kind of like an ignition coil or something. And you got the antenna here. Then this is connected to here to a another secondary here which feeds this and this is also connected to the earth um, that symbol so it's not connected to the chassis here so what happens is that these caps are oscillating back and forth in that AM uh, frequency range just like the Tesla method because you can use the identical pulse modulator there for that purpose and but what happens is one of the phases here comes out it's connected to this secondary, but it's connected to the primary here. I'm sorry, this is actually connected here, like this. So these secondaries are actually in parallel on one side of the primary. And so what happens is this phase here is uh, grounded to the earth, which doesn't make sense to engineers who are looking at it from a conventional perspective, thinking, well, why would you do that? So if you walked up to an outlet on the wall and you're powering something on there, and if you took one of the straight prongs and you connected that to ground, would that make any sense? Like, you know, what's that about? It makes absolutely no sense. Here it makes perfect sense once you understand the reason for that and why Lakovsky did it in this very specific method. So what happens is if it, whatever's in between the antennas here, um, you're still kind of getting the ba back and forth bounce like this, where it's getting polarized one way, then opposite way you know, in the AM frequency range, but about 50, you know, just roughly speaking, maybe half is making it to the other antenna and half is going back to this antenna. But if you're, st if you're standing here, for example, and let's say your feet are on the ground, well, you're essentially also connected to the earth where it's grounded to a earth rod. So what happens is half of it actually has a path to move through whatever is in between the antennas uh, down to ground so that the current from the earth is moving back up through the person and there's your ionospheric to earth kind of connection on steroids that Lakovsky has designed into this by doing the doing this method and that's exactly why one of the phases is grounded and so does anybody have any questions so far on this basic concept <coughs> You're talking about like the Grill Society and... Yeah, the will just ripped off that terminology. Uh, Grill, the coming race. The one thing that um, you might have uh, forgot to mention, and okay. I, I was following this machine for like 20 years, so okay. back when Peter was doing it, and no examples of it were available. Mm -hmm. That was the thing that got missed, is that these guys actually found the machine and were able to back engineer this circuit because no one knew what how it worked. Okay, right. Okay, so the, so the history of the uncovering of the MWO is that this was one of the most coveted machines that everybody wanted to know what it was, but nobody could because they just disappeared off the face of the planet. Um, Lakovsky had done some clinicals on different stuff back in the early 1900s, and it looked like some people weren't happy with how, success, how much success he was getting with it, and the whole thing kind of got buried. And it was, um, anybody know Bob Beck or who he was? 
kind of a very well-known uh, researcher, and, and he helped to fund a lot of different people and different projects and stuff. And uh, uh, I know quite a few people who knew him. Um, and what he did was he kind of brought the conversation about Lakovsky MWO back out. And I think if it wasn't for Bob Beck, nobody might not even know who, who Lakovsky is. And so Bob Beck was also kind of connected to Borderland Science Research Foundation, which was kind of a nonprofit that Peter Lindemann, Eric Dollard, and some other people were involved with. Uh, Borderland goes back probably maybe even to like the 40s or something like that. But uh, Dollard and Lindemann and, and some of them, they were involved with it, I think maybe in the early 80s maybe, up until maybe the er early to mid 90s or something like that. And so in there, there had been a couple uh, publications that came out, you know, videos and books talking about the MWO, but a lot of it was really just speculation because nobody knew what the ultimate evolution of what Lakovsky was actually doing. Uh, since nobody had a machine, they couldn't verify it. Lakovsky did have a pa uh, did have a patent, but if you built what the patent was, that's not what Lakovsky was actually doing, and he was just kind of covering some of the the gist of some of the principles of what he was doing. And so there's people coming out with suitcase versions of these MWOs with ignition coils and all this kind of stuff. Not to say that there was no benefit to it, but that really was not what Lakovsky was doing. And then about maybe 10 years ago, some European engineers got hooked up with somebody who wound up finding that there was a couple crates of these MWOs that were perfectly crated up. So they brought these out, they reverse engineered it, they put out a report about maybe 10 years ago, something like that. And originally it was just available in Europe and somebody I know in Croatia, Zvonimir Rudimino, he is somebody who built a lot of uh, scale model replicas of Tesla's devices for the museum over there. Very brilliant, gifted uh, engineer. He made, um, he was the first one to take that information and actually make a commercially available MWO, which looks like a museum piece. It's absolutely beautiful. It works. It's built right. Uh, he's helped me with stuff in the, in the past. He's, he's, he's a wizard. You know, he's, he's very talented. Um, don't you have one of those? And by the time you got it to Seattle, wasn't it about twenty twenty five thousand dollars? Twenty five thousand dollars if you want if you want one. Has the big instead of a pulse modulator in a compact box like that, more military style. It's maybe I don't know, maybe about this high with all the metal case where the practitioner stands behind it and turns the dials and you know uh, it's, it's it's really something that should be in a museum. It's that quality. But again, by the time you get one to Seattle, you know, like Seattle, twenty five thousand uh, dollars. The second person, I think, who made it available is somebody around Michigan or something like that. And he was making them like in a wooden box, very, very noisy. And uh, Peter Lindemann had one, and it worked, but the guy put the line filters and all this kind of business in the wrong place. Every time he kicked it on, router would go crazy, the wireless phones would, it was just completely scrambled everything. And so um, those were the only two that were, you know, uh, the one from Europe was exactly to spec on what Lakovsky was doing. The one from Michigan or wherever state this guy is from, I'm not going to mention his name or anything. Uh, it wasn't really built right, but it's close. On his website, he claims he's doing everything specific, but it was a very noisy instrument that people really shouldn't be using unless it had to be rewired. There's somebody in uh, the Netherlands you search online, got these big beautiful coils you sit between, but they have this long wire that goes to the case where the pulse modulator and the coils are. Well, you don't want that long line right there. It's, they're just making up their own thing to make it aesthetically pleasing and look real cool like some, you know, H.G. Wells time machine thing you're sitting in with this Ikea looking chair and all this, but uh, it's wrong. You need that antenna butted right up to the coil for it, for it to be proper. There's one in Australia or New Zealand, it's not even, the right one. And so after all that, a couple years ago, Eric Dollard, he uh, started working with Jeff uh, uh, at the shop and designed the original uh, pulse, uh, prototype pulse modulator unit that that unit is based on. And it's the only one in the world where it's actually properly shielded, more like military style. I'm not going to say military spec, but it's moving in the direction of using grounding practices that nobody else is really doing for this kind of stuff. Inside that case, there's a divider plate. All the low, f low frequency, low voltage stuff is on one side. On the other side of the plate is where all the high frequency, high voltage stuff is. Because if you don't s isolate them from each other, all that RF, all that kind of stuff can feed into that low voltage winding. It's just, it's kind of a mess. Um, uh, but even the one that, that you have is not shielded like that. It's all within one box. 
And so, you know, even the spark gap, and we got a fan blowing through it, where that spark gap is, there's a, like a screen with copper wire terminations going around the edge of it, and that's grounded to keep the RF from coming up and killing the wires in the little muffin fan motor. So, I mean, if there's something that can be considered as far as how to properly ground it and all that kind of stuff, Eric engineered that stuff into it, and that's what's available in there. So that's the cleanest, most efficient pulse modulator on the planet, hands down, uh, no contest for anything in this category, and especially for the MWO. And these things are tuned so well, you know, we're not going to run it now. It'll be available all weekend. There'll be demos and stuff. And when you look at the output and what we can get from a, originally we started with like a 15,000 volt transformer, went down to uh, 12,000. Uh, too big, too bulky, but also we have a 9,000 volt 30 milliamp transformer in there and the output on it is exceeding everybody else's MWOs using um, voltage, you know, 12, 15,000 volts. We're doing with a 9,000 volt transformer because it's tuned better, it's more efficient, and it's just clean. Um, let's see what the time is. Okay, so one thing I want to mention is, wh where's James Chalmers? So, James, you built one, and let's see. I'll show you where good engineering practices might, might not be um, a good idea for stuff that is, you know, in intentionally wants to do something that you normally don't want to do, <coughs> which is, for example, inside of the unit where the, um, the, the, high, voltage, the high voltage output you know, let's just say this is the um, high voltage transformer. You know, the, the AC comes into here from the wall and it's varied and the high voltage output here feeds into these little chokes which are supposed to uh, fill, keep some of the high frequency stuff from feeding back into the transformer and killing its windings. Um, and there's other precautions that are taken to eliminate that. But what happens is um, originally uh, to reduce noise even more, if you have an AM radio running and you can hear the buzzing, if you take like a capacitor here and you ground it like this, which is what you did, uh, and, and Eric had put that in and a lot of that noise went away. However, when you're looking at the arc from point to point on what that spark looks like, it should be really, really white bright white in the very center. When you put these filters on, which is good engineering practice, that's what you'd want to do, um, that goes away and it completely changes, it's a, it's a, the quality of the spark changes and it's no longer the exact spark that is uh, the, the signature of the Lakovsky output. So as soon as you remove these chokes, then it comes back and you get the bright white back in the center. It's what? Yeah, remove the capacitors here. So things that you would typically think, well, you need to do because this is good standard practices and stuff can actually take away the benefit and what Lakovsky was really after. And I think in that, in that reverse engineering report, it has a picture of kind of the spark. And I know Paul was very focused on that where, you know, this is kind of what you're looking for. And I noticed very distinctly that all that went away when we had when we had the caps on there, so we re we removed them and it brought it back. So that's why you know you're you're doing what what would make sense, but don't do what makes sense. <laughs> so, but I just kind of wanted to kind of make that point. And so all these different considerations of what should be done or what shouldn't be done um, is, is all figured in into that unit. So you know if you're looking at twenty five thousand dollars for a unit from Europe, or you know maybe a 4,500, 5,000, one in a wooden box that will just scramble, you know, everything in sight. Those are available. Um, so these right here, we're retailing for 7,000. If you're at the conference, 6,500. Uh, we're going to be doing a batch of 20 starting production in August, and those will be going August, September, October, by the end of uh, October. So about three to four units per month. Some of you waited a long time to get one. And... Um, in contract manufacturing, I have limited experience. First product I produced was the Bedini RPX sideband generator. And then jumping from that into an MWO is like crazy. That's like going from preschool to, you know, PhD without having anybody to really teach you. So 
we kind of went through hell figuring all that out from scratch and wound up uh, finally uh, about 85% of everything on that is locally manufactured and fabricated right here in Spokane. This thing is 100% made in Spokane, Washington, not outsourcing to anywhere else. And just like the, the RPX, 100% everything is made in Spokane. Um, and so little by little, uh, maybe by the end of fall, hopefully 100% of everything is, is made for it so that we can increase production. And then by the end of the year, the goal is to at least have most of the assembly done. So all we have to do is focus on uh, order fulfillment and we can focus on prototyping, getting other stuff out. Because like I said, I literally have like a mini encyclopedia of stuff in all kinds of categories that we want to put into production because people coming to these conferences over the years, you know, the information is, is you know, top notch. You can do something with it, but very few people will. They just want to buy something. And so, you know, the last two years, I've really been putting a lot of focus into moving in the direction of getting the manufacturing connections and all that kind of stuff together so we can actually start kicking out a lot of these things that's been discussed over the years and it's going to be the easiest way to actually get it is, well, nobody else is doing it, so, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to take it on. Um, so anyway, these are 6,500 at the conference. There's a batch of 20 that we're going to be uh, having. So like the cases, we'll have 20 cases made at, you know, SciTech in Spokane, where um, Seth is going to be talking on contract manufacturing. And um, so about 10 units or so we're offering at, at that discounted price. And, you know, so roughly we're going to be kicking out maybe three or four a month, which is a big difference because some people waited almost a year while we're going through all that process. And in contract manufacturing, I learned they don't know how to spell the word urgency. It's, it's like it doesn't even exist. And I see why, because if they're doing something kind of oddball, like, you know, what is this? They kind of got to figure out a lot of the manufacturing process from scratch themselves. Thousands of dollars in tooling. If you think you can just take this to a ring bending place and have them do that, I'm sorry. There's maybe like uh, about the only company in the country we could find that would take it on with very expensive tooling and even set up to properly do it right so that the, the, the rings will come and match mm -hmm. and all this. It's a very complicated process. Uh, it, they happen to be in Spokane, Washington. Um, and, and that company is specifically set up to do a lot of oddball stuff that nobody else will take on. They, they don't even have a place in Seattle. They don't have a place in Portland. They don't have a place in LA. A lot of the big cities, they, they're not set up like this particular company who makes you know, fuel tubes for missiles and all kinds of stuff. I'm talking you know, very specialized kind of stuff. And so, um, I don't know, anybody have any questions? So using it with curly photography to see if there's any kind of, you know, energetic differences, no. Yeah, I, I don't know anybody doing that specifically. You've mentioned that you've recently made some uh, improvements. Yeah. Can you discuss that? Some of the improvements in the pulse modulator is that we have a um, better grounding system that connects the ground, um, uh, some grounding strips on the back plate in the high voltage section uh, to get a copper bus bar tube coming into the low voltage section. Um, one thing we did is where the, uh, where the high voltage output on the transformer um, <coughs> feeds the chokes. Uh, the chokes have uh, more winding, so there's a little bit more inductance. But um, originally, the, um, the wire was like non-resistance ignition cable. And so after putting in 1,000 ohm per foot suppression ignition cable with the coiled <coughs> deal, uh, you're able to draw less of a spark from here, which means that um, there's, there's less feedback that can come back to here. Every time we find something that we can do to improve it, we're doing it. You know, between five different units, there might be four or five different improvements that are made along the way. So, you know, we're not just, I guess we're just not satisfied. Sati the UHF furnace, the one thing that the engineer looks at and goes, oh, we don't need those capacitors, let's pull them out. Yeah. The whole idea is those capacitors keep that arc from being an arc and turn it back into a spark to get the interruptions. Yeah. And you can't have anything like on that. You can't have wires swapping around or mm -hmm. so the way this thing is designed is that's all right there. 
Yeah, so Eric is saying that it, it, everything is compact without all these long wires and all this kind of stuff because um, you want all real short, hyper short connections as possible. Yeah, yeah short and thick. So in a lot of places, instead of wires from the spark gap to the doorknob caps, which are in parallel with the gap that discharge and create these higher current bursts at the spark gap and stuff, they're all uh, metal strips. Flat metal strips are, are connecting these with enough width and stuff. And, you know, even like that copper uh, bus bar, you know, um, I had a tendency to think in terms of resistance and it's more about surface area. And inductance. Yeah, so it's, a, it, right. So, I mean, you know, I, obviously I don't have a background in electrical engineering and, and RF and all that. It's been a learning process for me. But over time, seeing it, what Eric came up with and the stuff w where it's going, it's a dark art. You know, there's, there's a lot of RF engineers that are missing a lot of the stuff that could be done. But, you know, coming from military background and, you know, that kind of stuff, there's a little bit more emphasis on certain kind of practices that are not conventionally taught, you know, like ham radio <laughs> operators, they'll know a certain amount, but when you really start getting into real specialized stuff, it can just kind of go on forever, you know, it's never ending. Um. Yeah, um, I found the transformer design, you know, you always use the same amount of copper on both sides of the mm -hmm. transformer, the primary and the secondary, and the way the same. Well, in a normal transformer, you enclose the electrons with the three, and they're all in the copper. With the system here, uh, you're using another source of electrons, which is the earth. And the electron supply in the earth is greater than what you got in a copper loop. So you have an abundance of electrons flowing from the earth through the circuit standing. Yeah, the, uh, the Lakovsky method is an open system and that the tel Tesla balance one, I guess you could say, is a closed system because it's all contained and there's less leakage and stuff, so, so that... There's no electrons in this. This is all ether technology. You can just forget about the electrons. Yeah, the electrostatic, see the electrostatic field going back and forth is just like two capacitor plates and then the polarity just flip-flops. So there's not really current flowing through that, but nevertheless you are still grounded. Yeah. Static mat, like the like the grounding thing, so you don't blow out your electronics. Uh, I wouldn't want anything stra strapped on me that I couldn't like just shake off. But yeah, the, um, they, they operate on the same on the same concept. You're just kind of yeah. So that's so that was some of the main differences that I just kind of wanted to point out between the, the the balance and everything. And eventually we will have the the balanced uh, center tap coil and a matched um, other coil that can just be bolted onto the same stand, same pulse modulator. Then you can do some of the different Tesla type experiments um, and like Eric's cosmic induction generator experiments. Uh, it's possible to do that with uh, the balanced method. And so there's a lot of plans for other stuff that will be made available that can just plug right into that pulse modulator. So um, the you talked about the wave going through the air and the wave going through the ground, and the uh -huh. wave going through the ground will get there quicker uh -huh. and it will maintain its power. Uh -huh. Do they always exist together or can they each exist separately of each other? Well, an AIM radio station, it's, simultan it's both at the same time, right? Yeah. And then his question is, can you just have one without the other? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the crystal radio initiative is probably the basic explanation of making a Tesla-style crystal radio it plugs into the ground so you can receive AM through the ground in that method versus through the air. So, so that's communication, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have the bandwidth for digital. Yeah. It's, a, it's an narrow ban bandwidth, I don't know, Morse code and some other very limited uh, But anyway, it, the, there's, a, there's things that Eric kind of wants to move in that direction for the telluric transmission using some of the big um, AM transmitters and stuff down at the shop. And, um, you know, at some point if the funding is available and there's the time to do it, there, there's a whole project that addresses exactly that. 
Uh, so. Yeah, Eric's going to go into quite a bit of that in both the Colorado Springs talk and also the electrodynamic seismic forecasting talk. So, so we've probably got to wrap this up. I'll take one more question. So what are the reported benefits or effects of experiencing open end flow? Okay, so I can't make any claims. Uh, but, but, but I'll say this. Uh, Tesla did write about his balanced method, and he reported similar effects. I know that virtually everybody, most people who sit in it, within a few minutes you feel them and it's de-stressing you. I have multiple pictures and Victor gave me permission to show one of them. Maybe I'll pop it up on a s slide later. Got about 10 pictures of them because every time he passes out in the, uh, in the MWO I take a picture and I threaten to put it on Facebook. <laughs> and, uh, so th and, and so that's common. You know, I, 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 uh, so you feel very, very relaxed. Outside of that, um, there's data being compiled behind the scenes by various people who have had them for quite a while. Uh, I don't want to speak on any of that. Is that the photo of uh, Tesla sitting in the car with a giant coil? That no, that, uh, that has a lot of his magnifying transmitter pictures. I don't know if there's any pictures of his so-called ther electrotherapeutic <laughs> device, but there's um, written articles uh, by Tesla describing it. Yeah. And he was just using uh, basically capacitor plates, you could say, versus this ring kind of concept. It'd take a long time really to gather enough data and stuff like that to see whether the rings are necessary or not. This is a you know, mirror image replication of Lakovsky, so it can be authentic. It's possible maybe you know, early some of the tests we had shorted rings with an X through it, uh, basically just acting as a capacitor plate and uh, kind of seemed beneficial. So. It, you know, it could conceptually bring the cost way down because that's a very expensive process to have these rings done and to have them assembled. It's anybody who built it themselves took you three months just to do the rings, right? Okay, three months to build the machine. Okay, la last last question. Uh, Lakovsky had, I think, basically three. Uh, sizes that he was using, BV1, BV2, BV3, something like that, Jeff. And I think this is the sec, the middle one, maybe. I think it's BV, BV2 or something. It's kind of a combination. Yeah, yeah. So he, so he used different sizes and he also used different, different frequencies from about the 700 kilohertz range up to 900 or so. Um, and it doesn't really seem that there's any difference between any of them. Okay, Al, last question. Um, at the shop, I hardly sit in it myself because people are just stopping by kind of throughout the day, sitting in there for 15 minutes, 30 minutes. And um, when, I'm working at, when I'm working at the bench, um, I feel it, you know. It, it, it will be through this entire room if that was running right now. Obviously, it's, you know, quite a difference being right in between the rings, but um, after a few people are in it, and I'm maybe, I don't know, five, 10 feet away at the bench, um, after a couple of those times, I feel like I've sat in it for half an hour myself. It's very noticeable. Uh, I'm very sensitive, uh, you know, uh, to kind of what's going on. Um, Eric doesn't seem to feel very much. Uh, some people don't, but you know, uh, actually most, most people do. Had a uh, uh, biology professor from North Idaho College. She came to the shop and uh, she'll have a booth in the back room there. <laughs> and uh, she was definitely very aware of what, what, was, what was going on. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of unmistakable. A and it's cumulative over time. And I'd recommend anybody look at Paul Babcock's talk, Universal Medium, and that will give a very wide range of uh, you know, his experiences are. Uh, anybody who's known and seen Paul over the last several years, there's been a huge transformation, massive, you know, uh, uh, weight loss and energy and just 
a lot of things normalizing. It's um, I, I've seen it basically, you know, he's completely uh, a different uh, different person, um, and he'll be here, you know, pretty much all weekend. So, okay, well, I guess that that's it for that segment on the uh, MWO. And if anybody has any questions or wants to ask about availability, just talk to Jeff right there in the green shirt. And uh, okay, right. Thanks.